all that good stuff. Hi everyone, ooh, that's nice and loud, very echoey. Uh, we're gonna get things going in a few minutes. I think they're fixing that. that, that's not my voice. Check, check. Yeah, so we're gonna get things going in a few minutes. I apologize for the sound issues, so a few minutes to go.
Çık çık. Çık çık çık. Alright, let's put the back. I think it's right there. Alright, let's try that. That's better. There's all, the, all these other ones. I'm not sure we really need. Chick, chick. Chick, 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 chick. Chick, chick. Alright. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
And uh, hello everyone that's watching at home on Facebook Live, so I'll wave at you. Uh, very glad that you've joined us here today. My name's Ash, I'm one of the pastors at the church, and uh, you, you've chosen the perfect seats. Uh, it's quite a nice even spread, it's not dominant on one side, so good job for your seat placement today. Uh, just a few announcements to give. Uh, you may have noticed the, the Welcome Center tent over there. Uh, that is your one-stop shop for, for any information you may need on any events, uh, connection cards, giving envelopes. Uh, you'll also find over there these devotionals. Uh, it's called 21 Day Journey Toward a Generous Life. Uh, it was actually co-written by Gary Rawmeyer, who actually came out and preached here uh, around about a month ago now. So uh, today is day five. We started it this past Wednesday. So um, if you haven't started, you can start today at day five. Or you can start at day one and, and catch up to where we are at. And so we've got a lot of these left. They're right over there at the Welcome Center table. So we're going to go into a time of prayer. And then we'll hand things over to Colin to lead us into a time of worship. So when you pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another Sunday that we have to gather. And I just pray for us now, Lord, that the, the distractions around us would, would just fade away. That we just spend some great time in worship. We thank you for the breath in our lungs that you have given us. And I pray now, Lord, that we would, we would give that breath back to you through this time of worship. Uh, Father, I just pray for each and every one of us that are watching at home, that are watching here, or will watch this after it's been live. I pray that we'd be ready to receive a word from you today, Lord. May we be open to, to hearing from you, God. May, may the Spirit be, be sensitive to, to what it is that you would be speaking to us today. And Father, we love you and thank you and pray this in your name. Amen. Yeah. Good, morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Awesome. I want to invite you to stand and sing with us today. So glad to be with you guys. Uh, is the family of God just spending some time together, worshiping? And uh, as we get ready to go into a time of worship right now, um, I just want to share a couple things. For those of you who don't know, the last like, couple months... Uh, I've kind of been out of commission. I, I've been still working, but not as much with a microphone because my throat had some issues. And so for those of you who prayed uh, during that time, I just want to really thank all of you who prayed for me. It was very encouraging to have people. Uh, when you do what myself, Troy, and Ash do, use your voice for a lot of what you do. It can give you a lot of anxiety. Uh, but praise God, um, the last couple of weeks especially, I've had a lot of healing uh, in my voice. And so I just want to thank all of you who, who were praying for me at that time. Um, but as, as we're prepared uh, for our time together right now, this moment we have together to worship, I thought of my voice healing. I thought of John chapter 4, what Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, this interaction he has with this woman. And he brings a lot of really much needed clarity for our minds and our hearts regarding what worship is and what he's actually said, what he says, what worship must be. Uh, and in verse. 24, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 24, uh, Jesus kind of gets to this point that he makes in this conversation with this woman. He says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. God is spirit, and his worshipers, guys, that's us. Now, every single one of you today, I, of course, I don't know all of you here today. I don't know why you showed up today, uh, why you may or may not be seeking uh, God and, and, and his presence, uh, his help, him as your refuge, uh, him as your joy. Um, there's some very important things we have to know. And I thought about my voice uh, finally being healed up and kind of realized this idea that transcends my voice is the idea that God, that I uh, must worship in spirit and truth. It doesn't say anything about my voice. This is speaking to, to my heart. And something I've been thinking a lot about maybe lately and considering that is that our worship must transcend time, space, and matter. It does not matter what your circumstances. You still worship in spirit and truth. You must worship in spirit and truth. It doesn't matter what craziness is going on in this world. I think we all agree this world's a little crazy. Anybody agree? That's it, right. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it gets twice as bad Ten times as bad as it is right now, our worship must be in spirit and truth. And we live in a world that wants you to base everything off of not spirit, but physical. Right. Not spiritual, but physical. And that, that's not how we worship. 
It wants you to base things not off of truth, but whatever feels good to you in the moment, whatever makes sense to you, and that's not how we worship. We don't worship based off of what makes sense to us. We worship based off of truth, and that truth is who God is and who God says you are. And for those of, here today, those of us here today who have put our trust in Jesus, the truth is, is that you're a sinner saved. And then the truth is, is that's true for all eternity. And the truth is, is that God's unchanging. God is eternal in all of his attributes, in his holiness, in his justice, but also in his mercy. This, this is all truth, and it's what our worship is based off of, and it's done in spirit as well, meaning it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're here in a tent, whether we go back inside the building, whether you go home, wherever you are, whenever you choose to worship, it must be done in spirit and truth. So what I'm going to do is just lead us in one more prayer as we get ready to spend some time worshiping together. And God, we just thank you for this time that we have, Lord, and pray right now uh, that you, a God in spirit, what a blessing it is that you make yourself available to us any any time, anywhere, no matter what's going on in our lives, God. So we pray right now as we know your word says that you draw near to those who draw near to you, God. We want to draw near to you, and so we ask and beg you, Lord, to draw near to us. Right now in this moment, in this space, Lord, I pray right now for each heart and soul in this space that they would feel an overwhelming sense of your presence blocking out the many, many distractions within our own personal lives in this world globally, whether our voices can sing to you or not, whether we can stand or not, uh, whether we are struggling with anxiety and depression or we're on top of the world with joy and happiness, no matter what's going on, God, let right now in this moment, let us honor and glorify you that our worship would not be dictated by anything worldly, but spiritually, God, understanding who you are in truth. God, so right now, receive our worship. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Troy, one of the pastors. So let me pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. We've uh, heard that sung. It's kind of a spiritual anthem in our country, God, but it is so true. Your grace is amazing. And God, we pray that you would give us grace and abundance, armfuls and armfuls of grace, and God, that we'd also hand that out to others in our lives. And God, that... Uh, living a life of grace would bring us the most joy. And we praise you, and we thank you for this time. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome everybody that's online. Uh, we'd love to see you, and uh, look forward to seeing you. Uh, Colin, you might have, or Ash, that thing's flying up, and it might start blocking the view, that little thing that says use your QR code. Just rip that off. That'd be awesome, or pull it down. Um, so, one of the things that we're trying to do in a world where there's just so many difficult things going on is to do good. And uh, we get out in the community. One of our themes is we're in the community for the community. And a couple weeks ago, we made a, a big push for that. And I'm going to bring up Allison here in a moment. And Allison, if you've been following our series in the book of Acts, is like Dorcas, the lady with the worst name in the Bible but the greatest heart. Uh, her other name is translated Tabitha or gazelle, and I was sharing that sermon last week, and my wife said, our Dorcas is, is Allison. She is just always doing good. The description is always doing good and helping the poor, and Allison's going to share a little bit about her work. She works for United Christian Services, but she does this, and she's just a huge blessing to us. You're going to want to do one step closer to the thing. Okay. She in plan? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> like Troy said, I'm Allison, and I run United Christian Services. One of the projects that I asked Freshwater to get involved with a few weeks ago was the Learning Garden. And so we have had such a great response uh, from you and from the Recovery Zone, who I also want to mention, um, that I asked Troy this week if I could give an update, and so here I am. I just want to say... Thank you to everyone who came out to the garden. Um, we have had a marvelous transformation due to regular support out there on a Tuesday night, 6.30 till 8, and from the recovery zone on Thursday, 6.30 till 8. Um, the first night after I made um, an appeal to the church, we had 27 come out and help us um, with the garden. Yeah. We managed to do about four weeks' work in one evening, so it is completely transformed. Um, the second week, we had about 19 people, and um, so, uh, actually for a t couple more weeks, and now it's kind of gone down to six to four people, which is fine. Just um, remember that come the fall, when I have some extra work, I will be making another appeal, and I expect 27 people out, right? <laughs> Okay, I wanted to give you some numbers, because I like numbers, it helps us know what we're up to. So, um, over the last four weeks, Freshwater has provided us with 154 man-hours in the garden. <laughs> we have harvested 165 pounds of produce from the garden. Most of that went to either people who were working in there on that night, or to people through the food porch, people who are facing food insecurity. So we've been doing a lot of good in the community, feeding people who otherwise might not have, you know, fresh produce. We have um, laid down paths using 24 yards of wood chip. And while I'm talking about the wood chip, I want to say an extra thank you to Freshwater, who arranged for a delivery of um, free wood chip to us from Mataman Landscaping Supply just down the road. Um, and also, I have another delivery kind of in the, you know, in the background, ready to come at some point for more wood chip. We can never have enough wood chip. Um, so thank you, Freshwater, for arranging that. And um, also, um, we had worm castings from Diane, Diana, who um, has helped us uh, provide some, you know, great nutrition to the uh, land that we needed. 
Um, I wanted to tell you a funny story. We are called the Learning Garden, and one of the reasons is because we like to learn together how to do things. I am actually not a gardener. My husband is the one that does all the gardening. I actually don't like getting my hands dirty in the soil. But um, <laughs> Troy's wife, Carrie, was telling me that about uh, her uncle, who she had seen some onions that he had grown, and they were huge. And her onions in her garden weren't very big, so she asked him, how does that happen? And he said, what you have to do is remove the soil from the top of the onion. So she told me about it, because she saw that our onions were small. And guess what? Now we have giant onions in the garden. So that's my tip for today for you. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that uh, we also had eight raised beds adopted. So next year, we're going to have more raised beds. If you want to adopt a raised bed, then you are welcome to come and see me. You have to look after it yourself and grow your own vegetables and stuff. We have nothing to do with that but we encourage you to come and grow your own um, uh, vegetables. It's not too late. We've still got lots of work to do, as I've hinted to you. And if you just want to come out and see the garden, then come out on a Tuesday night and see what we have done. And um, just a big thank you to all of you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, I wanted to say this too. I said in the first gathering, uh, I really missed, I don't know where Colin is. I, there he is. I really miss Colin's voice. Uh, not only his call to worship was amazing, but I just think you've got such a blessing there that you can bring so much of uh, God just uses you in so many ways. It's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful expression. I touched my heart both gatherings, and uh, we're just so thankful that your voice is better. That is, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I did enjoy the week of sign language you did with me. That was really, yeah, I don't know. To... All right, I'm going to start with an old church joke. And if you don't like it, you can blame Colin because I was on the fence and I told Colin about six in the morning this church joke and Colin laughed. And Colin's not a, just giving out laughs to people. And um, I'm going to start with this, and it makes a pretty good point, but I'm going to read it because it's a, uh, a long, tedious joke, kind of, and uh, Craig Darling would like it. So, once I saw a man on a bridge about to jump, I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe that? Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or Jewish? He said, I'm a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What denomination? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1879, or Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lake Region, Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1912. I said, die heretic, and I pushed him over. <laughs> If you, didn't, if you didn't like that, I apologize. <laughs> that used to be a joke about all the different denominations and divisions in the church. And why I tell it right now is because America used to laugh at that, and now that is what America has become. We have so many issues. You could walk through that with a person all the way down and then say, mask or no mask. Or could you say vaccines or no vaccines? Or will you say this phrase or not say this phrase? Uh, uh, or the greatest one, Popeye's chicken sandwich or Chick-fil-A's chicken sandwich, right? <laughs> but growing up, growing up seriously, the main division that I remember is Rocky versus the Russian, Coke versus Pepsi. And now this is what somebody wrote about a show called America Divided. It's no longer just Republican or Democrat, liberal versus conservative. It's the 1% versus the 99. It's the rural versus the urban. It's white men against the world. It's climate doubters clashing with climate believers 
Bathrooms have become battlefields. Borders are battle lines. Sex, race, faith, and ethnicity are now all tense. The melting pot seems to become boiling over. And we think about all the tension and all the division in our culture. And I've just had this picture of Jesus over and over with his arms open. When Jesus died on the cross, his arms were open. And I believe Jesus' arms are open to all of us. And the only time Jesus closes his arm is when he wraps them around us. And Jesus came to bring us together, a world that was separated by our sin and selfishness, to bring the good news that was announced when he was born, good news to all the people, good news of great joy for all the people. And there's this picture in the book of Revelations where it says every nation, tongue, and tribe were gathered worshiping Jesus at the throne. And as we've been talking in our series through the book of Acts, the mission that God has given the church and the mayhem that follows when we do the mission and the multiplication of the church in the book of Acts. The book of Acts starts out, verse 1 and 8 says this. Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And quickly the church reached Jerusalem. And then the church went to Judea. And then it went to Samaria. But it's been seven to ten years now, they estimate, in Acts chapter 10, where it is still not reached the Gentiles. That means somebody not Jewish. And in Acts 10, it talks about the gospel going to the ends of the earth, going to the Jewish people. And I believe that God wants his good news and our goodwill and our love and our grace to go to all people. So I'm going to read Acts 10. We've been just going verse by verse through this, and I'm going to read verse by verse, pick out some things, but also stress that we are people to bring people together in unity and bring the gospel message to people so that they can not only have peace with each other, but peace with God. This is Acts chapter 10, verse 1. And I'll say this, if you're coming out and we don't have a screen right now, get your Bible, put your Bible on your phone, uh, bring some notes. Um, I believe this, that the point that God might have for you may not be the main point that I think you need to hear. So writing this down, something might strike you and you'll be able to remember more of this. This is Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in which was known as the Italian regiment. So this is a soldier. And this soldier is centurion. I don't know how I missed this. You probably know this. It's a little embarrassing. I've been going to church for a long time. I've been a pastor a long time. A centurion just means somebody that oversees 100 people. Uh, I should have known by the word century there. But he is a powerful leader of many people. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So he was a good, good person, but he wasn't a follower of Christ yet. He had not heard the message, the gospel. But it's a challenge to us. He was devout. He was God-fearing. He led his family, and he was generous, which meant that the things he learned about God, he put into action to bless people. He loved God and loved people, and he prayed regularly. And it says, one day... At three in the afternoon, he had a vision. And I think three in the afternoon is about the most boring time of the day. It's the time of the day you're after lunch, you're a little sleepy, but not this day. On this day, at three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius sta stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, here's the truth I want to encourage you on. God notices our life. God knows what we're doing in our lives. He sees it. He took notice to Cornelius' life because he was doing great things. You might go, I, if God noticed my life right now, he might be disappointed or frustrated or have a lot of issues. Let me say this. God noticed all of our lives, and he sent Jesus Christ down to live for us to be an example for us, and to die for us. God noticed your life and your struggles and sent his son to die for you. So as this moves forward, verse 5, this is what the angel says. Now send men to Joppa. It's about 30 miles north. I'm sorry, 30 miles south to bring back a man named Simon 
who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And I just love that. Every time I read this passage, I've read a lot, I just love that Simon has a beach house, and I just think, <laughs> I don't, but it just seems like I just have this picture of this beautiful uh, looking out on the sea. And when the angel, this is verse 7, when the angel who spoke had, to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and, the, and a devout soldier, so three of them, who was one of his attendants, he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now, the challenge is here, God does look at our life and then sends Jesus to us, and the promise is he will forgive our sins, and then he will remember all the good deeds we do. But the challenge is, are we like Cornelius? In response to God's goodness and our understanding of God, do we obey? He obeyed with no conversation, no pushback. He did it quickly. And I just wonder for us, do we obey that way? Do we do everything God tells us? Do we do it quickly without any pushback? He asks no questions. He comes out of this vision and says, go. Verse 9, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. So as they go to get Peter, Peter is now uh, going to have a moment here. Verse 10, he became hungry, wanting something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now, I've had this once when I went to Popeye's and I was waiting for their chicken sandwich. All right, I'm kidding. They have slow service, but amazing food. All right. But Paul, now Peter falls into a trance. He saw heaven open up and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. And that word sheet there is sail. So it might be that Peter was looking out onto the water and saw a sailboat and then all of a sudden went into this trance and then here's what happens. This, this sheet that comes down, it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, Kill and eat. Now, in Le Leviticus 11, there is a stipulation of what animals are clean and what animals are unclean. And, and Peter's probably seen a mix of clean and unclean animals. And he's like, no, this isn't good. So he responds, verse 14, Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And the ramifications of this is this is an illustration about people, and God is trying to teach Peter, and he gets it later. Don't call anyone impure that God has made clean. And we live in a world of one of the most divisive things that's been on the forefront is racism. And if you need something to figure out like why racism is wrong, it's not because it's not fair to people. It's not because, it's because God finds value in every person and he has opened the door for salvation to all people. So we should close no door to anyone and we should not call anyone impure that God has made clean. Now, verse 16, this happens three times. And immediately the sheep went and was taken back to heaven. Now, for Peter, this must have been kind of compelling because Peter denied Jesus three times. And then the rooster crowed. And then Jesus restored him three times. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? So seeing this three times must have really spoke to Peter, this, this repetition. Verse 17, after this sheet has been back up to heaven, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men, that, that three again, are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate. Go with them, for I've sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jews. A holy angel told him that you have come to this house or told to come to his house so that he could hear what you had to say. 
Now, I just want to take a pause here, and sometimes God's timing is really difficult and really strange. That three in the afternoon moment with Cornelius might have seemed like this is a strange time and not a complete message. I want to encourage you this way. Don't get discouraged or confused when God gives you a message at a strange time and you don't understand the timing or the full significance of it. And also, second thing is don't demand that you know everything right now. I believe that God, faith is that God has enough credibility that you can get a part of the puzzle and he says, go, and you begin to walk. And what I would encourage you finally is to let your obedience lead you to his revelation of his faithfulness. This thing that started at three in the afternoon, all these people are obeying, and we're going to see what God is doing here. Verse 23. Then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guest, which is significant, and you're going to see that later. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the other brothers from Joppa went along, about six men. We learn that in the next chapter. They, the following day, he arrived in Caesarea, Cornelius was expecting them, and he called them together. Or he had called together his relatives and close friends. Now, I just want to say this. When God tells you to obey, and he says he's going to do something, do you wait till it all falls in place? Or are you like Cornelius? This is exceptional. He actually anticipated. He was expecting what God was doing. I might have been like, okay, uh, you're gonna, uh, God, you, you want me to go get this guy named Peter? And Peter's going to come back. And I might have called some of my friends and said, hey, this guy named Peter, if he actually shows up or if this message happens, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, we'll have a party and we're going to listen to what he has to say. He has so much faith. He's expecting before it happens what God does. I want to encourage you. If God gives you a promise, even before it happens, expect it. And know that it's, it's I'm going to encourage you. Look in the Bible at his promises and expect him to do it and be ready to do that. Verse 25, as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Now, this happens almost every day when I get home. My wife just falls <laughs> at my feet, and I'm almost oh, been 25 years, babe. I'm just a man. Uh, she was here for the first gathering and said something like, I thought that was funny. Enjoy finding a ride home. Um, <laughs> No, I love this. As a leader, if you're a leader or you're someone blessed with power, finance, Peter has amazing spiritual clout. We look at Peter and we think about Peter and some of the bumbling things he does. Peter has become so powerful. He's raised people from the dead. When he walks past people, his shadow falls on people and people get healed. And when somebody bows down to Peter, Peter still realizes, I'm just a man. If you're a leader, there is one gift that you want to receive, and that's humility. Where you understand, God is great. No one's lower than me. Nobody's above me. God is great, and we are just people. It's a pretty amazing thing that Peter did not even take a moment to feel like a celebrity pastor and go, well, thank you. I, I have race. I, I did walk on water. I, I did, Jesus called me one of his friends. He said, get up. Verse 27. Peter begins to talk. Talking with them, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit with him. Now, I think we know in the Bible that the Jews and the Gentiles had a divide, but I don't think we realize how strong it was. Uh, they called the, the Gentiles dogs, but it's even greater because they would have, Jewish people would have dogs in their homes, but they would not go into the home of a Gentile or have a Gentile in their home. In fact, there was a rule of thumb that if a Gentile was giving birth and they were struggling, a Gentile woman and a Jewish person saw them, they were not to help them because all they were going to do is bring another Gentile onto the earth. This is a huge moment. This is seven to ten years after Jesus had told them to go into all the world. But this is what Peter says, end of verse 20, 28. 
But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. And I just want to encourage you, whatever wall you have or whatever struggle or whatever group or whatever distinction or discrimination, and sometimes it goes the opposite way. There are people that are poor and discriminate against the rich. There are people that are uneducated, discriminate. We just all struggle with this. I've been watching this thing called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And in this uh, thing, he's a pretty articulate guy. He kind of admits that he struggles when he saw a, a black girl marry a white guy. And we just all struggle in so many different ways. But spiritually, because of what Jesus do, did and what God shows his value for all people that we should never call any man, any woman, unclean or impure. So you need to search your heart and find out where that is and we need to think of how we can bless other people. I kept kind of wrestling with the spirit of God to put this in because this is so small. But I went to South Haven and I was at the beach with uh, Ruby and my wife Carrie and we... I think I was putting some hand sanitizer on and some hand sanitizer just sticky and my hands are sticky. So I was trying to get water from a water fountain. And of course, right now they're not doing water fountains. And I look up and there's a black guy and he takes the water out of his cooler and throws it to me. And it is the weirdest thing. I felt so connected of all the tension and all the junk. Just there are small ways that we can bless and help and reach out and show kindness and show love and show people that there's not a divide. Verse 29. This is Peter. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent me? Cornelius answers, four days ago, I was at my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me. And I'm sure Peter's like, I know who that is. In verse 31, and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gift to the poor. Send a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now, I love this phrase. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Now, before he starts this, I just want to encourage you to adopt this attitude when anybody opens up the word of God. We are here in the presence of God, ready to listen. Meaning this, God, we're here, you're here, we're all ears. We're all here, God, you're here, we're all ears. When people open up the word, would we take on that humble, open-eared, tell us what the Lord has commanded you to tell us? Verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. And before he tells him this, he says, now I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. So you may not even be to the point where you go, I'm not racist, but is there any favoritism Everybody deserves respect. God has opened the door to all people to salvation. We open the door to all people to God's goodness and kindness and love. We preach to them, but we also know that they are worthy of respect and honor as a person. It says, I now realize, and this is growth for him. This is Peter, the apostle, still growing as a leader. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts, accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. It's just an amazing thing uh, that this is seven years in and it's taken them this long. So continue to be gracious to people. Continue yourself to seek the word so that God will continue to open up your eyes and show you. And where does he show us? In his word. Show me, God, where I need to grow, where I'm blinded, where I'm not seeing it, where I'm not understanding the full range of your word for whatever you have for me. Now this is what Peter does. Peter preaches what we call the gospel, the good news. 
And I was with a friend and this friend said to me, and I think this is so true, we don't hear the gospel a lot in the church. We hear a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts. So I'm gonna read this to you. This is Peter's message to Gentiles, which most of us are probably not Jewish. And this is what he says to them. And you may need to hear this. You may be coming to church and seeking, you may be watching. This is what Peter said, what Jesus did. He says, you know the message God sent the people of Israel. So in their day, they knew about this, the, kind of like they knew about Jesus. They knew kind of what something went on in Israel. Uh, if you don't, pick up Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, read it, reread it. We need to be very familiar and kind of in that to know what God did when God sent to the people of Israel this message. It says, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. So they know about the miracles. They know about the work. They know about the crowds. They know some of this and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went about doing good and healing all those who are under the power of the devil because God was with him. They said, you know what? God sent Jesus. He was anointed with power as his son to save you and he was rescuing us. This may be a hard thing for you to hear that we were under the power of the devil, that God was sending Jesus to remove the spiritual bondage we had. Verse 39, we were witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and Jerusalem. So you say, now our job, God has told us to tell everybody to be a witness. They killed him. Jesus came to give this message and to free people. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. So the testimony is Jesus died on the cross and that he rose again and he was seen by people. It says verse 41, which is an interesting wrinkle. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses, witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Verse 42, he says, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God anointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So he says, this is the gospel. Jesus came, he was anointed, he, he overcame Satan and the power of Satan, the people in his country, the religious leaders, they nailed him to a cross. He rose from the grave. People saw them and we went and preached. And then he says this, that the prophets have been testifying. And this is an interesting thing if you've read the Old Testament. The prophets have been testifying that everyone who believes in his name will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. That's the gospel. And if you've never responded to that, you need to talk to someone or you need to call to God and ask him to, to forgive you of your sins through his name. And if you do believe that, that's the message you need to tell people. Jesus came to overcome the spiritual bondage. He was anointed with power in the Holy Spirit. The Jewish people, the Jewish leaders killed him and he rose from the dead and people saw him and ate with him. And that the prophets have been testifying that there is forgiveness in his name. Verse 44. While Peter was still speaking the, these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, the six men plus Peter, who had come with Peter, they were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. See what had happened? This is, this is my biggest point of the sermon right now. It's going to happen right now. I think it's going to do another one, so we'll see. What had happened is when Jesus left, he promised the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon the Jewish believers, and they spoke in different languages, different tongues. They were amazed by this, and this was a sign of the Holy Spirit 
but now it's happening to the Gentiles, which they did not believe could receive this blessing. This amazing moment that we hope when we preach that the Holy Spirit moves. Verse 46, he says, for they heard them speaking in tongues or languages and praising God. And then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? Because Peter later in verse chapter 11 says to the people, they were, they were opposing Peter. This is how scandalous this was. This would be like pulling Billy Graham into your house and saying, how dare you preach to another race of people? They pulled him in and they were questioning Peter and he said, I remember God said, you baptize with water, I baptize with the Holy Spirit. These people received the Holy Spirit and the people that were opposing Peter relented. So he says in verse 47, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as you have. So in, he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them a few days. That's chapter 10 of the book of Acts. I believe God can speak many things to you, and there's a lot of things to think about that. But I believe that our job is God has opened the door of the gospel and wants to see all people come in is that we love all people. We treat all people with respect. We serve all people. We don't let anyone bow down to us because they're not below us. We serve all people. When John the Baptist was talking about Jesus coming, he said, uh, make way for the Lord. Make way for the king. And he, he talked about this was a practice in their, their regions. They would remove stones and flatten hilly places and make the pathway easy for the king to come so he would have an easy path. We need to make an easy path for people that don't know Jesus by loving them, caring for them, removing any division anything that's harmful. We need to stop thinking our rights and begin to think the rights of others and to be sensitive to them. There was a youth pastor I knew, and he didn't demand this of anybody, but he was a very funny guy. He was like a, almost a professional magician, and he wasn't creepy, right? He was a good magician, and he was really funny, really witty, and he, he told some joke, and he hurt one of his students. He was sarcastic. And he said, Troy, at that moment I decided I will never be sarcastic again. And that just always left an impression of the small ways that we can make big impacts and the ways that we remove barriers so that people can receive God's grace. Remove barriers and, and remove all prejudice from our minds so that we can be with the people and preach and share so that they can receive Christ is our Savior. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for something that happened three o'clock on a day long, long ago that affects us right now at noon. And God, I hate, hate, hate the division in our world. I hate how it's stirred up. I hate how small of things we can get caught up. I hate that there's not conversations and that we don't give people respect. God, in the name of Jesus, would you help us live differently? We laugh at that story of somebody pushing somebody off a bridge because of, of some small difference, God, but we act this out in so many different ways. Would we not let the evil one, our own selfishness, our fear push us apart, but would we sit across from each other and break bread and try to understand and forgive and heal and, and love and understand and encourage and build up and inspire. We're put on this earth to take the message of Jesus to all people and then to build a family where we're, there is love and grace and peace and there's no division, God. And we just pray that you would do that work in small ways and big ways that we would not underestimate of throwing a water bottle to somebody or, or changing a small behavior, God, that we would have the heart for other people so that they could understand your heart for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing together.
blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God Born of his spirit, washed in his blood, perfect submission, all is errors. I am my savior and happy in Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Ooh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side, and angels descending, it bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. So this is my story, yeah, this is my song, praising my Savior oh, all the day long. Praising my Savior oh, all the day long. Sing this together.
Thank you so much uh, for joining us for worship today. We really hope that you were encouraged and blessed by the teaching. And as you go, these very words we just sang, for I desire to worship and obey, take that sentiment with you this week. Considering what Troy talked about in Acts chapter 10, removing all of the barriers between us is God's church now going forward, desiring to worship and obey. On your way out, feel free to visit our Welcome Center tent to see the many ways that you can be involved here at the church and we'll see you guys next week. Have a great week.